My name is Erica George. I'm the director of the Tanner Humanity Center. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon. You are coming from all parts of the country and we are grateful to have you here. We acknowledge that we are here in Salt Lake City and we are standing on the unseated or seating, sitting on the unseated ancestral lands of the Goshu, Ute, Eastern Shoshone and Paiute peoples. We are utilizing the technology of Zoom. They're based in San Jose, California and that is the unseated territory of the Ohoni peoples. We also must acknowledge that the prosperity that we enjoy in the United States is due to the labor of enslaved persons and we acknowledge that as well. Beyond this acknowledgement, I invite you to increase your understanding and part of the mission of the Tanner Humanities Center is to do just that. So at the Tanner Humanities Center, we support research for faculty and student fellowships. We do collaborative research interest groups and we basically promote the humanities through exploration and engagement through our academic research, our educational outreach and our public outreach. And today's program is public outreach. We are able to be here today for um, the support because of the support of some entities I'd like to thank. Um, first and foremost, the Tanner Foundation makes this possible. And you are joining us for our final virtual Tanner at Home series program. Hashtag free the hair, black beauty, equity, art, and expression. I also would like to thank our partners in this conversation, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, in particular, the director, Gretchen Dietrich, and her staff members, Maggie May Trolley and Ashley Marie Farmer, who were instrumental in helping us organize. And we are doing this conversation in conjunction with the Black Refractions exhibit, which is visiting us from the Studio Museum of Harlem at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. And last but not least, my incredible staff, Beth, Susan, and Katie for their contributions in making this possible. The way our program will work this afternoon is I will first introduce an artist to you, and then I will introduce to you an activist, academic legal scholar. First, to kick off our program, we have Alexandra Barbier. She is an artist who's full of questions and quirks. She values curiosity in play and experimentation. And she was featured in the Black Refractions exhibit, offering her thoughts on a particular piece that we will talk about today. Um, she's primarily a choreographer and has an expansive idea of what art is. She's a multidisciplinary artist. She offers multi-layered performances and she is creating work that intends to investigate community and communities and sees creation as celebration. And as we are here to talk about black art and equity and expression, I can think of no more appropriate person to introduce um, than Alexandra. I am going to share my screen and start a show. Um, for those of you outside of Utah, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts has had the Black River Actions exhibit up since January. And I will turn now to Alexandra to talk about a particular piece that I also was gravitating toward um, when I saw the exhibit. Alexandra. Thank you, Erica. So I don't love this piece, at least not immediately. What is it anyway? A hunched dragon perched and defeated, someone's penis. I skimmed the other artworks for something else, but I can't stop thinking about it. I return to it. It is interesting, but do I like it? And is that even a relevant or an appropriate question? I see the title, Repugnant Rapunzel, Let Down Your Hair. It's a pile of tires and bits of metal that have been twisted, mangled, and braided. Twisted, mangled, and braided are words that I've used to describe my own 4C kinky, coily hair countless times. Twisted like the wet strands that I separate into small sections to wrap around each other after washing, conditioning, detangling, oiling, and moisturizing before I go to sleep. When I undo these twists in the morning, my curls will be popping. Not matted or mangled the way they would be if I simply washed them, then rested my head against the pillow. Braided, like my hair five days after this process, when the curls have become flatter and less impressive and I give myself a crown of French braids. I think of Rapunzel's long, blonde and luscious hair that looked like the hair of all the white girls I wanted to be in elementary school. 
opposite of the go-to looks for black girls like me. Slicked buns uh, formed around rolled up socks, pigtail braids that have shrunken because that's what curly hair does, secured by ponytail holders with large plastic beads, pressed edges and relaxed tresses that frizz uncontrollably after recess in the humid air of my Louisiana hometown. I began to cry, remembering the hatred that I harbored for my hair until my 20s, until I moved to New York and saw the afros, puffs, cornrows, frohawks, locks, and pineapple ponytails donned by confident, beautiful, proud Black women. They inspired me to big chop my hair, my damaged, relaxed hair, and finally go natural to finally see and learn about the curl pattern that I was born with, to finally love it instead of constantly fight with it and destroy it. I don't love this piece, at least not immediately, but I love it now that I realize that it reminds me of my journey towards self-acceptance. I love it now that I realize it represents the labor that black people exert to maintain healthy curls. I love it now that I see it as a rebellion against the categorization of hair as good or bad. I love it now that I recognize it as a celebration of texture as we fight for legislation to protect natural hairstyles in workplaces and schools. I love it and I hope you do too. I love it. Thank <laughs> you. I love that. Everything Thank about you. it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. One of the reasons we wanted to bring together art and expression um, was to be in conversation with social change and legal change and um, hearts and minds often precede any kind of changes in the law. My next guest is Professor Wendy Green. Um, Professor Green, this isn't really her first visit to Utah. Um, I will introduce and explain. Um, she's a dear friend of mine. She grew up in South Carolina and she was five years old when she learned what civil rights activism was and discovered it was in her blood. Missing school because she was sick, she read a book about African-American pioneers, including civil rights advocates like the late Justice Thurgood Marshall of the US Supreme Court, and this prompted her to have conversations with her parents and her mother about their own civil rights work in the South, um, which included sitting in on lunch counters and voter registration drives. With her parents as her example, Professor Green started her own civil rights journey while in law school, and she began to uncover a discrepancy in anti-discrimination law, which for decades has allowed for lawful discrimination against Black people's natural hairstyles in the workplace and in schools. Working on this, civil rights issue for more than a decade, Professor Green is finally being heard and she's become a leading voice in a global movement to combat race-based natural hair-based discrimination. Her scholarship is focused on intersectional and multidimensional analysis of workplace discrimination and on the social construction of race. Among other things, she has successfully argued against biological constructions of race that have shaped federal court decisions entitled um, Seven Actions and in um, helping employers understand Title VII jurisprudence. She coined the term misperception discrimination and is concerned about discrimination that arises from an employer's erroneous perceptions of a person's racial, religious, or ethnic identity. She's educated diverse constituencies, including many of us here in Utah, and um, she's making great strides. Her scholarship has fueled substantial legal advocacy She's one of the architects of the federal Creating a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair Act, commonly known as the Crown Act. And she's advocated for its passage on multiple levels, state and municipal as an expert witness and as an advisor. And she's been a trusted advisor and friend to those of us here in Utah. Most recently, the state of New Mexico successfully eradicated discrimination based on hair textures. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing here to invite Wendy to join us. Um, again, I've given very abbreviated introductions of our illustrious guests. Please check the chat for more information about them. 
Um, Wendy, will you join us? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor George, for inviting me and also Alexandria for um, starting this conversation in such a beautiful and meaningful way. Um, I really don't know if I have too much more to share other than um, I'm going to do a little bit, hopefully, um, in terms of trying to provide some context. And it looks like I might have um, frozen. Let's see here. <laughs> but hopefully by sharing my screen, it will unfreeze me. <laughs> so let's do that. Can everybody see that okay? Okay, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of context and also bring in um, some more artistry um, as it relates to this conversation around natural hair discrimination and even more specifically around the celebration of African descendants, natural hair textures, and natural hairstyles like afros, braids, locks, twists, bantu knocks, among other um, types of styles that we have historically and even currently uh, wear. So let's get started here. There we go. So as we've already mentioned, um, as it relates to natural hairstyles and African descendants natural hairstyles, they are very much an artistic expression as you see here in an 1835 painting by Jean-Baptiste de Bray. Um, these, these are depictions of the, the really glorious hairstyles, the very regal hairstyles that Afro-Brazilian women were wearing during this time period. And um, additionally, as as it relates to um, the really the centrality of natural hairstyles with respect to Black people's uh, struggles for liberation and even just our um, celebration of our liberation has really dated back long before um, the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movements of the of the twentieth century. Um, for for many of us, we may be aware that um, Africans and African descendants wore hairstyles, as we see here like uh, Angela Davis that is depicted in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And there, this is just as actually a piece from, um, from an exhibit um, on natural hairstyles and in particular, particular around uh, the, the political expression um, and similar to what um, Alexandra was talking about, how the Afro symbolized self-acceptance self and resistance to forms of oppression and namely racial oppression. Uh, many of us think about um, natural hairstyles as being a political expression or a political state um, however, um, as historians have noted, um, African descendants around the world often wore their hair to really express their social and political rank, their marital status, their age, their religion, um, their ethnicity, among other types of statuses within society. And when we think about Black people's liberation and our liberation struggle, um, not only is it about, you know, you know, trying to eradicate discrimination on the basis of our skin color, but also as it relates to our hair texture. And many of our museums, like the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, like um, the Utah Museum for Fine Arts, as well as even in the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, has made um, natural hairstyles and the depictions and portrayals of natural hairstyles of African descendants a central feature. Um, and so for centuries, alongside our skin color, African descendants' natural hair texture as well as hairstyles have served as a basis for racial exclusion, segregation, and marginalization in a number of spaces, and, and also a means to a fringe upon our liberty, personhood and autonomy. And this depiction from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, I think just really um, highlights, you know, as, the, as you can see here, signs of segregation. Even in the era of Jim Crow or racial apartheid in this country, um, there were laws that actually mandated that we had to have we had to, um, when we were going to beauty shops and, and, and barber shops, that they had to be racially segregated. And much of it was being fueled by these misperceptions and assumptions about um, you know, our inferiority, uh, but also in particular about um, a particular st stigmatization as it relates to our 
our hair texture. Um, even early on in uh, colonial US history or post-colonial US history, we see early American jurists um, actually demarcating physical characteristics that would mark a person as African descendant and therefore enslavable um, or as European or indigenous and therefore uh, free. And one of the very key markers was not just a skin complexion, but even more so about our hair texture. Early American jurors actually uh, expressed in jurisprudence, in freedom suits in particular, that if a person had a woolly hair texture, independent of their skin complexion, so even if they had a fair skin complexion, that their woolly hair texture would mark them as African descendant and therefore enslavable, whereas if you possessed a straight hair texture, that did not have the propensity of becoming woolly, it would mark an individual as white or European descendant or indigenous and therefore free. So literally our freedom in this country and also in other countries um, was very much contingent upon not just simply our skin complexion, but also our hair texture. Um, scholar Dr. Althea Prince reports that reports incidences of lighter skin fugitive slave women who would shave off off their hair in order to mask this critical marker of their racial identity so as to avoid the possibility of being enslaved or re-enslaved. Um, fast forward to the 21st century, we still see, um, you know, discrimination and and, and exclusion and segregation um, and this deprivation of personal freedom, cultural freedom even at, um, via our hair and via our hair texture and hairstyles in particular natural hair and natural hairstyles. Uh, many of us are probably very much aware of Andrew Johnson, the wrestler, the high school wrestler back in 2019 who was uh, compelled to cut off his locks or forfeit the match. Um, additionally, just a month later, we had uh, DeAndre Arnold and Caden Bradford in Texas who were effectively expelled from their Texas high school uh, because they refused to cut off their dreadlocks. And additionally, Arnold was unable to participate in his high school graduation for refusal to cut off his locks. And then this also happens in workplaces. So it's not just limited limited to our educational spaces, but also happens in an employment context where we, where we see African-American men who are donning uh, locked hairstyles or natural hairstyles like locks um, um, from, they are denied employment opportunities and they are forced to cut off this very critical feature of their cultural and racial identity as a condition of employment. And unfortunately, this is not limited just to African-American boys and girls, uh, African-American boys and men, but we also see uh, just, um, you know, pervasive incidences of this type of discrimination occurring in high schools, as well as middle schools and even in professional schools um, uh, that's being suffered by African descendant women and girls. And these are just some examples of that where we see in Massachusetts and in, in Florida at the same time, uh, high school uh, students, um, particular African-American uh, girls who were issued detention, they were barred from extracurricular activities, barred from attending their prom because of their braided hairstyles and pursuant to their school's grooming policy, they were deemed um, unacceptable. Um, additionally, we had another student in Florida, Nicole Orr, uh, who wore an Afro and she was instructed to put her hair in a style. Um, and her Afro was also called out of control and a violation of the school's grooming policy because it was perceived as being dread-like. Um, this also flows into the workplace where Black women are often instructed to either chemically straighten their hair or to cover their hair. Um, additionally, cover, cover, covering their hair, uh, meaning through wigs or weaves because their natural hairstyles are deemed unprofessional or, or distracting, as in the case of, um, we see here, that is um, in, in Jessica Powell's case, uh, where she was told to keep wearing wigs at work because they didn't accept her natural hair. And then Juliet talks about how her natural hair was deemed too distracting for the office and that her only options in order to maintain her employment or to avoid stigmatization is to either uh, get a wig or lose her job. So Black women, men, boys, and girls around the world who done natural hair 
hairstyles are not only losing employment opportunities um, as well as educational opportunities, but they're also subjected to discrimination in housing as well as public accommodations. Um, they are also being subjected to stigmatizing treatment uh, by virtue of derogatory epithets as it relates to their natural hairstyles being deemed unkempt, disheveled, unprofessional, aberrant, radical, militant, unruly, distracting, wrong, extreme, unusual, unattractive, and unacceptable. And we might think that this kind of discrimination, we may very much understand that it is a form of a longstanding form of racial discrimination, a very unique and um, um, a very unique to the African, de African descendant experience. However, um, um, and, we, and we understand that, um, that this is a form of racial discrimination. And we do have federal civil rights protections against racial discrimination in our workplaces and schools and housing, um, as well as in other spaces. However, unfortunately, our federal civil rights laws up until more recently have not really uh, regarded this kind of discrimination as race discrimination or unlawful race discrimination, except for in the cases of Afros. Um, and as you see here, um, in a federal district court judge actually ruled that um, even though there was a petition being circulated within an office that was calling a black woman's natural hairstyle unprofessional, um, even though it was very much offensive, it did not amount to unlawful racial discrimination or more specifically Specifically, it did not um, rise to the level of a racially hostile work environment and therefore did not violate our federal civil rights protections, namely Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, which bars racial discrimination in our workplaces. Um, and also we see here in cases where African-American men and women have challenged uh, natural hair bands as a form of race discrimination in violation of Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, they have been almost uniformly um, uh, um, unsuccessful, unfortunately, in large part because of this application of a legal fiction um, of a judi judicially created doctrine known as the immutability doctrine. And what this does is that basically it, it declares, um, or what judges have declared is that uh, racial discrimination is only limited to immutable characteristics or characteristics that you are born with, characteristics that you cannot change, characteristics that are difficult to change, or characteristics that all individuals of a particular racial group possesses or that they only possess, which is absolutely impossible. Because for example, there can be an African descendant person who has a fair or white skin complexion. Um, and just the same, you can have a, um, a white person or a person who identifies as white, who can have a brown or darker skin complexion or can rock an Afro as opposed to straighten hairstyles. And similarly, you can have black people who, don't, um, who are unable to wear Afros and also have straight hairstyles. So there's no um, one racial one characteristic that only one racial group or socially constructed racial group actually possesses. Uh, but um, what federal courts have said is that discrimination on the basis of immutable characteristics that will amount to racial discrimination that violates our federal civil rights laws like Title VII. However, discrimination on the basis of those things of characteristics that are mutable, cultural characteristics do not, uh, because Title VII does not prohibit discrimination on the basis of culture. And even more specifically, in these cases challenging natural hair bands in workplaces, they have demarcated what I call a hair splitting legal distinction, which is that discrimination on the basis of Black hair texture is an immutable characteristic while adverse action on the basis of a Black hairstyle, like locks, braids, or twists, um, does not amount to unlawful race discrimination. So what does that really mean in layman's term? It means that under federal jurisprudence, discrimination on the basis of an Afro violates our federal civil rights protections against race discrimination. However, if you suffer discrimination on the basis of styles that flow from that Afro hair texture, like locks, braids, and twists, it is no longer uh, deemed unlawful race discrimination. Um, it is outside of the protections um, that are afforded to us on the basis of racial 
on the basis of race. And so what I have argued in my legal scholarship is that this is really contrary to what we know about race. Race is very much a social and um, political as well as a legal construct, um, but that doesn't, and it's, but it still has very much uh, meaning in society. Um, our, our skin complexion, our hair texture, our hair color, our hairstyles, our dress, our clothing, our language, our accent, our speech, even where we live, where we go to school, and even what we are named are often racial and therefore serve as a basis of racial discrimination. And so our federal civil rights laws should actually acknowledge this, that when we think about race, it is a social construct. Um, it is not a biological construct as the immut immutability doctrine um, has uh, really tried to, to, to reinforce. Uh, but rather race includes physical appearances and behaviors that society historically and presently uh, associates and commonly associates with a particular racial group. And this is a definition of race that I put forth in uh, a 2008 article, Title VII, What's Hair and Other Race-Based Characteristics Got to Do With It, which has been endorsed by the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, as well as quoted uh, by the Eleventh Circuit in a very seminal case, EEOC versus Catastrophe Management Solutions, as an authority on the social construction of race. And this case, EEOC versus Catastrophe Management Solutions, is it quite, um, it ser has served as an impetus for what we know as the Crown Acts, um, the Creating a Respectful and Open Workplace for Natural Hair Act, because in that case, uh, the federal district court actually reaffirmed uh, 40 years of legal precedent, precedent uh, uh, um, that um, precedent as it relates to the immutability doctrine. And, um, and basically what, again, that 11th Circuit case declares is that uh, discrimination on the basis of race is only limited to immutable characteristics and that discrimination on the basis of the plaintiff's locks did not amount to unlawful race discrimination. So with these uh, le with this legislation uh, known as the Creating a Respectful and Open Workplace or World for Natural Hair Act, um, what we're doing here is that is clarifying um, and providing a clarifying definition of race and in particular the original Crown Acts define race as traits historically associated associated with race, including but not limited to hair texture and protective hairstyles, and go on to enumerate that protective hairstyles includes but is not limited to hairstyles such as braids, locks, and twists. Uh, since the first um, adoption in California, we, there are now states uh, that have uh, passed into or, or have enacted uh, the Crown Act. Uh, most recently, uh, we have New Mexico that has adopted their own legislation that is um, very much influenced by the Crown Act, but is more expansive than the original Crown Acts um, in that it not only expressly uh, clarifies that natural hair discrimination is a form of race discrimination, but it also includes protections as it relates to cultural expressions uh, via, via our hairstyles, hair covering, um, among other types of uh, characteristics like even our, um, our dress. And um, there's been a lot of movement, um, as um, Erica has already pointed out, uh, there's also a federal Crown Act that was just reintroduced just um, last week by the Congress women here, Presley, Omar, Moore, Lee, and Watson Coleman, and, um, and I am I had the privilege of actually being able to uh, co-draft this legislation alongside um, uh, the, the legislative staff of uh, co uh, former Congressman uh, Cedric Richmond, um, as well as the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, among others. And if this is passed, um, it was passed by the United States House of Representatives last fall, but it had, it had to be re reintroduced this session. And if it is signed into law by uh, President Biden, um, then it would, again, clarify that discrimination on the basis of characteristics commonly associated associated with race and national origin and workplaces, housing, public accommodations, and federally funded institutions would violate our federal civil 
examples like Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, among others. Um, there's even been more movement on municipal levels. Um, around 17 states have passed uh, legislation that expressly uh, clarifies that racial discrimination is inclusive of natural hair discrimination that African descendants pervasively um, encounter. Um, this is just another, just an example of how in this movement, um, this legislative movement, how art really does play such a central role in trying to really communicate the beauty of natural hairstyles, um, trying to really try to dismantle the negative biases and stereotypes as it relates to uh, natural hairstyles that African descendants commonly wear. And this is just one example of it in terms of New Orleans and their, um, and their campaign to support legislation in New Orleans, Louisiana. And Nia Weeks, who is the executive director of Citizen She United, an organization that empowers Black women voters, um, and uh, created a video series in a photograph session in collaboration with New Orleans-based photographer Gus Bennett. And these are just depictions of the 120 images of Black women and girls who are celebrating the beauty of their natural hair. We are very much aware of um, the depiction, the beautiful depictions through Black Panther that have circulated around the world. Um, we also are maybe familiar with, um, you know, a recent um, just beautiful depictions of um, natural hairstyles of children um, in glory, magical visions of black beauty by Karen and Regis Bedencourt, which is one of my absolute favorite um, books. Um, and we also see um, also in children's literature, you know, artist Nicholas Smith, as well as creator Matthew Cherry and illustrator Vashti Harris. Harrison, um, who really are trying to encourage, you know, hair love as it relates to our natural hair texture and hairstyles. And just lastly, more broadly, again, this is a part of a global movement to really celebrate our hair diversity. In Colombia, Afro-Colombian activist Edwin Salcedo launched a unique visual, visual and social media campaign in 2015, Ser Negro Es Hermoso, which is uh, to be black is beautiful, which featured 15 artistic portraits of Afro-Colombians, men and women posted throughout Cartagena. And um, Edwin Salcedo said that in doing so, we are, are in the beginning stage of a self-recognizing society. And he thought to have a campaign like this, it would push forward self-recognition and self-esteem and a different aesthetic of being Black. Additionally, uh, we see in Brazil something very similar as we've seen in New Orleans and in Colombia uh, with photographer Helen Manzao's work, which celebrates the natural beauty, strength, and power of women, regardless of their shape or size. And we see all of these beautiful depictions of women, um, um, diverse women uh, with diverse hairstyles. Um, and then finally, I wanted to just show you all a Project Embrace, their Afro visibility campaign that is is currently in London. And founder Lakia Lee has displayed nearly 100 billboards, Afro visibility bill, billboards that communicate the pride um, of Blackness, the pride that comes along with natural hairstyles. And she's done so throughout London since 2017 to really challenge Western or Eurocentric standards of beauty by celebrating the diversity diversity and beauty of Afro hair texture with the ultimate aim of disma dismantling the negative biases and stigmas often associated with it. According to Lakia Lee, her five-year plan is to celebrate the unique beauty of Afro textured hair all around the globe with billboards. And so very much um, in line with Lakia Lee, I too have created um, a movement in part, it started off as a, a hashtag, a social media hashtag, to really just highlight uh, the, 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 the kind of legal scholarship and public advocacy and engagement around grooming coats discrimination, and in particular, the, the very systematic discrimination that African descendants are suffering on the basis of our natural hair texture and hairstyles around the world. And this hashtag free the hair movement is very much a result of over 15 years of legal research and writing, teaching, and public advocacy around the world. And, and like others, um, other activists, um, other scholars, other artists, the ultimate goal is to secure 
legal, social, policy, as well as personal change so that African descendants around the world can freely rock our natural hair or freely wear our hair according to our personal needs and desires. So that ultimately we can all say that all, all hair is good hair. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Um, I think our two speakers, and I imagine our audience will agree, have perfectly blended the personal and the policy um, in ways that are deeply important. And we are deeply indebted to the wonderful Professor Wendy Green for really committing to and launching this movement and asking the important legal questions that can serve to confine freedom of expression in its full form, in its embodied form, in our state of being. Um, and that truly is a question of justice. I am going to open now for questions. There were a few that came into the chat. Um, both of our panelists, I believe, will be available to answer, if that's all right, great. So um, the most immediate one comes back to policy. And the question concerns what's going on in Utah. Um, this was posed by um, a community member who says that Sen Democratic Senator Derek Kitchen sponsored the bill. Why do you think it didn't pass? It got held in committee and was never addressed again. Um, so these are a bit in the weeds and local questions. Um, this other one connected and more expansive, and I think we can take these three together. Um, what will it take for the Utah legislature to pass the Crown Act has it passed in other majority white Republican states? Um, that's a great question for you, Wendy. And then I think this is perhaps for all of us, what kind of message, what kind of message is it sending um, to black Utahns in a super white, super majority white state, Republican male dominant legislature to support it or to not support it? So. Some of that speaks to the expressive messaging of legislative process. Some speaks directly to the politics of process. And the other is what does it take or what will it take to pass the Crown Act legislation? Um, I think I'll start to give Professor Green a breathing break. Um, yes, Senator Kitchen did sponsor the bill in the Senate. Um, Representative Sandra Hollis also, I believe, was intending to bring it to the House floor. I think it didn't pass um, in part because there were members of that committee that were not in a position to fully appreciate the nature of the injury, the importance of the issue, and there's more education that needs to occur. So I think that's some of it. Um, I'm hopeful that this isn't the first and last time that Senator Kitchen or another legislator who has demonstrated a deep commitment to equal protection and all members of our community will want to raise the issue again. Um, so yes, that is true. It was held in committee um, because it didn't secure enough support to emerge from committee. Um, and one of the things that we are interested in as educators and as artists um, is increasing understanding and improving education access and availability to people to um, understand the experience or understand the experience of different people. So um, I hope that's responsive. And then I think I will turn to um, Alex on the question of the messaging that is sent um, when actions are taken or not taken. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And um, I think the message is just that you're you're not okay, right? That how you are naturally and is unacceptable and that you have to change yourself to be able to be taken seriously, to be able to be respected um, and to be able to feel like a valued human. Mm -hmm. um, which I uh, obviously is very painful and has been very painful yeah. to experience my entire life, so. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if our audience had or if you had an opportunity to watch some of the hearing, but there was a child who testified about her experience with bullying and it, it was heartbreaking really. 
Um, so to have that either reaffirmed as your anxieties, worries, experiences are invalid or not important versus I hear you, I see you, I respect you and I will act. Um, those are very different messages. And I think it would be unfortunate if one were left with the understanding from expressions of misunderstanding or indifference that one doesn't matter, particularly among our youth. Um, but I think there is progress and I believe that Professor Green can share some of those success stories with us. One of the questions was how feasible is this? How does this happen? Does this ever happen in a majority white state or a Republican state was the question. Sure. So yes, it does. Um, you can look at, in terms of Republican, um, you know, I'm not quite, I'm trying to think here. I'm not quite sure that's been the case um, um, because I'm, I can't tell you the exact breakdowns of all of the, the political leanings of each particular state. Uh, but in terms of the demographics, racial demographics, yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of majority um, uh, uh, or say where uh, African descendants or even people of color are not the majority. Um, so New Mexico is one example yeah. of that. Um, Colorado is another example. Um, also, um, if we think about it, Maryland is probably on the cusp um, in terms of um, maybe some, some somewhat of equal distribution, if you will. Um, let's see. Um, so we also have, well, New, we have New York, New Jersey, um, and um, where there are more di more diverse uh, populations and demographics in those particular states like California. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not to say that there aren't, um, you know, pockets of, you know, lack of diversity within those states. Um, and additionally, we have on the municipal levels, um, they, they haven't all been, um, say, majority um, people of color. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about maybe Columbus, Ohio, uh, we can can think about Toledo, Ohio, um, among some other cities. So I think what is what largely is 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 a is a big function or is an educational function of this legislation or even advocating for this legislation or other types of legal reforms um, is that there are many people who are just simply not aware of this uh, form of discrimination and to the extent they may be aware of it they aren't really very um, aware of the pervasiveness of the discrimination as well as the consequences of this discrimination um, that um, really understanding is not only about you know loss of employment and educational opportunities which are very very important, but there are also some real psychological and emotional and even physiological harms uh, that are engendered by uh, this kind of racial discrimination um, that I often call the invisible harms of uh, natural hair discrimination, especially as it relates to African descendant women and girls. Uh, so because that's, that's a great transition because we talked first about policy and I wanted to take it to the personal and you're going there. Um, I wanted to, oh, in the chat, I see that Tucson, Arizona has now passed um, so the Crown Act. Um, one thing we haven't considered, and I think some of my law students are on because the questions are now turning to jurisdiction and immutability traits, um, is that there are multiple fora. And it could be that if this doesn't go forward in this Utah State Legislature, perhaps the municipality of Salt Lake City and the Salt Lake City Council would be interested in learning more about this issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we are seeing cities, um, and this is the importance, I think, sometimes we often think to like the, the you know, states and also even uh, more specifically to the federal uh, government to, to sort of, you know, combat these issues and, 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 and create these legislative fixes, um, which is, they, they do play a critical role in that. But, you know, local government is really important in terms of pushing uh, these types of um, civil rights uh, legislation. And, and I would even say historically, uh, it has been the localities, the municipalities and the states that actually prompted the federal government to do it when we get to, to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, additionally, even when it's not already um, unlawful, uh, we do have organizations, employers and educational institutions that are voluntarily changing and revising and rescinding their grooming policies um, to, to ensure that they are not engaging in this kind of uh, discrimination. 
um, not only on the basis of race, but also as it relates to sex and religion and gender identity expression, um, as it relates to grooming codes discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of activity that's even happening on the individual or organizational level, even independent of these types of legal reforms being it, enacted. Yeah. Um, here locally, I just want to give a shout out to Curly Knee. Actually, Lish Dub was in the hearing with us earlier um, in the year, could not be here today, but is doing some really important work with children and with families um, around issues that I think speak to the emotional, not just the employment, the education. Um, the emotional piece of this is quite personal and it intersects with the politics. Um, there was a question in the chat or an observation in the chat that some may not understand fully what um, a protective style is. I was gonna to turn to Alex to explain what some of that is. And then maybe we could just even talk about how different our hair is or style today. You see, I made some changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so protective styling is, I will back up a little bit and say that this is really hard to manage and it's worth it. Um, but I mean, washing, conditioning, oiling, all of the things that you have to do um, to make sure that it doesn't get matted beyond control is um, very time consuming. It can be very painful for people who've got like super, super, super thick hair um, and even going to sleep. I mean, uh, you know, if I have my hair out like this, um, if I wear it this way for maybe three days, by the fourth day, it is like very tangled, which by the time I get to washing it and conditioning, it takes a ton of time to undo. And so a lot of people who are in a position that don't have like the ability or the time to really um, style hair in their natural um, shapes and natural forms will choose to have locks or twists or braids. And it's not always just a choice that we make to like to look good or to look cute or to look pretty, but it's, um, it's a strategy <laughs> for survival. Um, and, you know, I am imagining or not imagining, I'm particularly remembering a lot of my friends who are black who when they're pregnant in their like final weeks oh. of pregnancy um, will have their hair braided because yeah. they're like, I don't have time. I don't have energy um, to deal with the detangling and the conditioning that's necessary uh, to have Afro hair. And, uh, you know, when I'm in the hospital and like sweating and uh, like laying against the hospital bed for hours and hours and hours, like to have a protective style before that is just really helpful. And then especially considering the first couple of weeks that you bring the baby home and you don't have time to take care of yourself. Wonderful, thank you. So um, for those who aren't experiencing living with black hair, that's a protective style. Um, these two women and maybe many of you who know me know that I usually have my hair in braids. Right now I've straightened it and that's something that takes a chemical process. Um, science conflicts that it's probably not the best thing to be doing to straighten your hair. But many of us do, depending on the level of conservatism in a profession that we choose, for example, um, law being one of them. I'm trained as a lawyer, practice as a lawyer in corporate forms and firms in New York and in Chicago. It never would have crossed my mind to have braids or dreads. Um, in fact, there would have been people at the time I was in practice who would have lost their jobs over appearance in this way. Um, on the personal side, I've only recently had the braids out and had someone who I hadn't seen in a while tell me, oh, your hair looks so good, so much better, which made me then think, did it not look so good before? And so there is, um, even at this stage of life, not as a young girl or woman, something about representation that shifts. So connecting this to representation in an art, um, maybe many of you have seen that beautiful photo of the young little girl looking up at Michelle Obama's portrait in the Smithsonian, um, seeing in her herself. And there are many different ways in which women of African descent appear in American society and in global society. Thank you, Wendy, for that beautiful presentation and slideshow for our sisters from Brazil and the UK. Um, I know there's some UK audience and Caribbean colleagues on the um, call right now. But um, this is personal, global, and political. 
and it's global and local and here in Salt Lake City. Um, and something that I think it's important for us to begin to understand and bringing to bear um, the art, the politics, the law, and the expressive activity. So um, also our very active chat here. Um, I just wanted to say one quick thing to what Alexandra pointed out um, in terms of it not always being a choice um, as it relates to wearing natural or protective hairstyles. And I can speak to mine right now is that I'm wearing faux locks. It was the first time I really not ever had my own hair. Um, so Erica, Erica's looking like, you're like, what? Because you see me with all different types of yeah. hair. <laughs> You've seen me with lots of different hairstyles, right? And hair colors and everything else um, in, in between. And, um, you know, the, the, the impetus for me even um, deciding to wear um, braids and in particular locks was because um, I knew I was going to have to move um, uh, to visit at an institution, actually a couple of institutions in cities that I call hair deserts. Um, and that is, you know, places where <laughs> individuals who can actually do my hair Hair, right, or that I would not trust to even, you know, try to manage my natural curl, my natural curl pattern, or my naturally curly hair texture, and um, and so I literally. Um, decided um, to do something completely different, right? Um, and 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 um, try out the faux locks. And then here comes the, you know, so that was back in what 2018, the fall of 2018, I believe. And um, and here we are, um, almost three years later, in large part because um, um, the pandemic too, um, and um, and 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 not, um, you know, many of us not feeling, you know, extremely comfortable about going to the hair salon on a regular basis. Um, and, um, and so I just wanted to point that out that sometimes it's about the physical, um, you know, in terms of not only the physical part in terms of geography, but even, you know, when I was living in Iowa, people were actually um, driving to Chicago, right? Um, you know, traveling these distances. And similarly, I did too. When I was living in Lexington, Virginia, I would come back home to South Carolina just to get my hair done every, you know, six to seven weeks. Um, so these are things that people often don't think about um, as it relates to our experience and the kinds of burdens um, that we are um, um, encountering economically as well as even physically and even physically in the, in the geographical sense um, in order to, to maintain our hair, healthy hair. Healthy hair. I, I'm embarrassed to share how much back and forth I did when I first moved to Utah, which was then a very much hair desert. Um, we've got some beautiful stylists um, in our community now, but it's a consideration. It was actually something I asked in my job interview. Could you not? Um, okay, others in the chat, um, parents and um, caring for their daughter's hair, the time consuming time of caring for multiple hairs, um, representation in Utah, and um, oh, the impact of comments. So this comes from Marcella, and then Billy has also raised it. Um, Billy has raised this in the form of talking about good hair and bad hair. And then um, Marcella is inviting us to speak about the impact of seemingly well-intended positive comments about Afro hair that aren't, or perhaps some of you have had the petting zoo experience where people are touching your hair we could talk about, again, why that's less than ideal. Either one, Alex, Andra. Yeah, I, that actually just reminds me of, um, this is all making me so emotional. So, uh, um, but it reminds me of, so I grew up, it was actually funny before this started, uh, Professor George and Green and I were talking about, we all have ties to Louisiana. So I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, Louisiana is a very bizarre place in terms of race. I think, mean, you know, we're struggling with it all over the country, but Louisiana in particular, in my experience is like, wow. And um, so I grew up in Baton Rouge and um, my family is actually Creole. We've got a lot of different skin tones, hair textures, and I actually have turned out to be the one that's got like kinky hair. Wow. Both my mom and my grandmother have wavy hair that uh, in comparison to mine is like very easy to manage. 
And so I started having relaxers when I was like six years old because, um, you know, as I, as I wrote about in my, um, my little story about Chakaya Booker's work that I went to predominantly white schools and saw a lot of my classmates and thought like, oh, I want to look like that. And then on top of that, um, my family was like, it is hard to wash and tangle and, you know, detangle your hair all the time. I w- I'm a dancer, obviously. And so like I was going to ballet and getting sweaty and tons of work there. So um, I remember probably in fifth grade, I, you know, my hair is relaxed. I had been straightening it. And this boy told me like, if your hair weren't so frizzy, you would look like a white person. And like, imagine that that was a compliment to me. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think that there are a lot of instances where people will say things that they think is a compliment or they think um, will make you feel better about yourself that are very underhanded and very um, insulting. And, you know, Erica, when you said uh, that the person made that comment about like your braids coming out in your hair, I think you said it looked better. Is that what they told you? Oh, you're muted. Sort of that, oh, that's different. That's really nice. You know, not, um, yeah, just room for interpretation, but yeah. Yeah, but it hurts. Well intended. Well intended. Yeah, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? (laughs) But then helping people understand and people are curious. So um, the good work that Curly Me is doing, I think will make these kinds of encounters less common. And the sharing of work and expression and art, I think can bring us closer to um, a better place where we are more appreciative, genuinely appreciative, not tolerant, but respecting and appreciative of beauty and its different forms of different forms. So um, we are running completely out of time. We have just three minutes. So um, I wanted to close with um, telling our community here about some additional opportunities. Black Refractions closes this weekend. My understanding is the show is sold out um, for the socially distant live visit. However, you can still see the exhibit in the audio project from Harlem to Utah, Stories of Blackness in which um, Alexandra is featured. And that's available on the UMFA website, which is in the chat. You can also watch a highlights video and explore perspectives from the artists and the curators. And if you're traveling to Seattle this summer, um, we'll see if the Crown Act gets to Washington State. You can catch the um, Black Refractions exhibit at the Fry Museum of Art in Seattle from May to August. Um, the artists that are in the show are also in the permanent collection. We have other pieces by Shakia Booker, Faith Ringgold, and Lynette Yodium Bayoke. So please do um, follow Tanner Humanities, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, um, the Crown Act process of legislation and support our wonderful local artists like Alexandra. Um, Please join me in thanking them and thank you very much for coming to hear this conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking at the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll leave the chat up for a bit. Well, you can stay. We don't have to leave, but the program has ended. So um, I'm closing recording. If this will be available later, thank you all very much. And I guess I'll record to the cloud. All right, thank you all.